Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the TMS today. My name is Anna Teti, I'm the TMS chair. And I'm very happy to announce that today we will have our first uh, debate on the role of the IF-1 as a survival factor, preventing intracellular anoxia or sedative stress. So we will have two speakers, Professor Gerhard Carpier from the Department of Chronic Diseases and Metabol Metabolism in uh, Louvain, uh, Belgium, and uh, uh, Ernestina Schipani from the Orthopedic Research Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, so this uh, debate is uh, meant to present different views on why the hypoxia inducible factor one acts as a survival factor. And Professor Carmelier will argue that it is because it prevents oxidative stress, while Professor Schipani will argue that it is because uh, it prevents intracellular anoxia. So this is a debate that will require a vote from the audience. Um, the first vote uh, will uh, um, appear and you will uh, um, uh, vote what you think is the right um, option uh, about the oxidative stress of the intracellular anoxia. And then the two speakers will have their presentation. At the end, we will have a, a, the live discussion. And then we will give them a few minutes uh, to um, uh, to uh, reply, I mean, for the rebuttal. And then we will have a second vote. Uh, during the second vote, if you change mind, just change your vote, because the winner will be who will gain more votes from vote one to vote two. I can present the speakers so we can save time. And uh, the first speaker will be uh, Professor Carmelier. She obtained her medical degree in 83 in the University of Louvain in Belgium and, uh, and then her board the certificate in pediatrics uh, in 1989. Um, during this uh, training, she uh, started the doctoral work in the Center of uh, Human Genetics and then obtained her PhD in biomedical science in 1994. Uh, uh, she is now professor in medicine and chairman of the Division of Clinical and Experimental Endocrinology. Um, she has several activities in training and teaching medical students and PhD students. She is known for her investigation uh, on vitamin D signaling and angiogenesis in bone development and disorders, and focuses now on how oxygen and nutrient supply may control skeletal cell fate and function. Professor uh, Schipani is uh, uh, instead MD and PhD in uh, uh, Professor of Orthopedics, Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, she's an Italian and uh, she graduated in MD and PhD at the Anna School of Advanced Studies at the University of Pisa. Uh, she did the, the postdoctoral studies uh, at Harvard Medical School, uh, where she um, uh, became uh, later associate professor. Uh, then she was uh, recruited by the Indiana University in Indianapolis and by the University of uh, uh, Michigan, and is now at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, she is full professor. Um, so, uh, Dr. Schipani discovered the gain of function mutation of the PTHR uh, uh, receptor 1 that caused the Janssen disease. Then she pioneered the notion that hypoxia-driven pathways control skeletal development. Um, she has established novel principles in the broader fields of G-protein coupled receptors and the hypoxia biology. And she's currently studying the role of hypoxia-driven pathways, mitochondria, and reprogramming in meta metabolism in skeletal development, homeostasis, and disease. Okay, these are our two speakers. So, uh, Marco, ready with the poll? So, I think the problem is we are too many. Ah, okay. So, that's a good problem. Uh, but okay. uh, I think we can uh, probably start with the first speaker um, and I will try to fix the, the issue with okay. another. Okay, see so if you fix the issue, maybe we can have only the final vote and we will see who will <laughs> win with the final vote. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so Gerd, please, the floor is yours. So thank you for inviting me in to participate in this uh, nice discussion and hopefully we will learn something about HIF signaling. So I will defend the, the topic or the concept that HIF is important to reduce oxidative stress. 
Now you know that uh, hypoxia can occur every time there is an imbalance between oxygen consumption and the supply of oxygen. And you can see this, for instance, also in the avascular growth plate during bone development, where you have here in the center an hypoxic region. It's also, of course, present in uh, several diseases where you can get hypoxia. This is, can be after trauma, bleeding, tumor growth, also with atherosclerosis, and also in regenerative medicine, where cells are seated on a scaffold and then implanted, often in a hypoxic environment. Now, most of the cells can defend themselves against hypoxia, and they induce many different pathways. The most and the best characterized uh, uh, pathway is the HIF signaling pathway. In this pathway, you have PhDs, enzymes, that use oxygen to hydroxylate HIF, a transcription factor, and by this hydroxylation, HIF will be targeted to the proteasome and degraded. So in normoxia, you don't have HIF signaling. When oxygen levels drop, like in hypoxia, the PGs cannot hydroxylate HIF anymore, and this becomes stabilized. HIF goes through to the nucleus and there induce a transcriptional program, inducing genes that are important for the cell itself, like uh, adaptations in metabolism, but also adaptations in angiogenesis, uh, making more red blood cells, and so on. Now, these PGs don't use only oxygen, they can also use other metabolites as cofactors. They, these are necessary. And one important metabolite is alpha ketoglutarate. On the other hand, metabolites from the TCA cycle can compete for alpha ketoglutarate. And by doing so, they will inactivate PhDs and also stabilize HIF. So it's not only the oxygen levels, it are also sometimes metabolites that can induce HIV stabilization. And finally, there's also ROS, the reactive oxygen species, that can in inactivate PhDs and thereby stabilize HIV. Now, how can ROS, that, how is ROS induced during hyp hypoxia? Most of the ROS is induced or is made by the mitochondria. Because, of course, in the mitochondria, you have the ETC, the electron transport chain, and there electrons are transferred, and at the end, they are transferred to oxygen, and by doing so, they generate a proton difference that can be used to make ATP. Now, what is seen is that, of course, the ETC uses a lot or consumes a lot of oxygen, and sometimes electron can be a leak out of this tra transport chain and produce ROS. Often this is a complex tree. Very recently, it has been shown that how hypoxia can induce, there is a possible mechanism, this uh, ROS production. This is a complex mechanism. I only mention a few things. What is seen is that if you have hypoxia, you have a decrease of the pH in the mitochondrial matrix. Calcium become uh, released from calcium phosphate crystals is then exchanged for sodium. So sodium increases in the mitochondrial matrix and this will then inhibit the uh, complex tree so that the electron cannot be transferred to oxygen anymore but produce ROS. Now, that's one thing. So hypoxia can induce ROS and then ROS can also contribute to stabilizing HIF by inactivating PhDs. The mechanism behind this is thought that there is an oxida oxidation of uh, some cysteines in PhD, then they will make a disulfate bridge, and so you get heterodimerization. By these heterodimerizations, you inactivate PhD and you get HIF stabilization. So this is the first part, that in hypoxia, you get more ROS levels. This ROS will induce HIF, but Later on, the, the HIF pathway will try to reduce ROS levels because if you have too high ROS levels, you will get oxidative damage and cell death. Now, how does HIF reduce ROS levels? I will present data from our own lab and we use two experimental models. 
One is in bone regeneration, where we implanted skeletal progenitors that have that expressive or that don't expressive, and these are then implanted exclusively, and we look at the degree of bone formation. The other model that we used is bone development, like I have already said, in the avascular growth plate. You can have hip stabilization, and we induce even more hip stabilization by inactivating PhD, so you have continuously hip stabilization. Now, first, we started with this ectopic model, so the bone regeneration model. When we implanted wild-type cells, skeletal progenitors, and we look after four weeks or eight weeks, we see that bone is formed here at the periphery and also somewhat in the center, where you have nice uh, bone matrix formed between the specula. Now, if you use HIF null uh, cells, you see that the, the amount of bone that is formed is only 25% of the control mice. So they can't form bone even not at the periphery. When we tried to look at the mechanism, we saw that even after a, a few days, the cells that lack HIF don't survive in vivo. That's here shown by this graph. So here you have the cell survivor of the wild type cells, and if you knock out HIF, they don't survive well in, uh, when you implant them. Now, then we wanted to, to know what is the mechanism behind this uh, impaired survival, and we looked also at ROS production. Now, HIF can reduce, it's known that HIF can reduce ROS production, and it's doing that by interfering here with the ETC cycle. What will it do? It increases the uh, expression of PDK1, and PDK1 will inhibit the transfer of pyruvate to the TCA cycle. And so, uh, pyruvate derived from glucose cannot enter the TCA cycle, there will be no oxidative metabolism anymore, and it's compensated by more glycolysis. And you see that in uh, hypoxia, wild type cells will increase PDK1, and this is blunted if you knock out HIV. So that's one part. The other part, that there are changes in several complexes of the ETC cycle. For instance, here, complex 1 is changed, this is the, uh, uh, encoded by Endufa, and you see here also in the skeletal progenitors, you have an increase in Endufa, which is, which is not, not present if you have a HIF knockout. And also in complex four, you have different components that can be present and uh, that will be changed. The outcome of this is that there will be less electron transfer in the ATC, and also that the electron transfer will be more efficient, so that there is no leakage of electrons from the ETC and to form ROS. Now, this is then uh, accompanied by changes in oxygen consumption, because uh, the ETC uh, is uh, in, uh, reduced. And this is shown here, where you see oxygen consumption in the wild-type cells, in the HIV knockout, you have an increase in HIV, uh, oxygen consumption because you don't block it. And if you use a hypoxia mimetic, this is DFO, you of course decrease even more in the wild type cells the um, uh, oxygen consumption, which is not the case if you knock out HIV. So there is less oxygen consumption uh, in hypoxia induced by HIV and thereby also less ROS production. So this is what I've shown al already. HIF will reduce the ROS production, but it can also increase antioxidants. And by increasing the levels of antioxidants, it also will reduce the ROS levels. So what, we have, uh, what are the antioxidants? You have several types. These are the three most important. You have the uh, dismut uh, superoxide dismutase that will uh, transfer or convert superoxide to hydrogen super, uh, peroxide, and then catalase and glutathione peroxidase that form water. Now, if you look here at the hypoxic condition, you see that all these genes are increased in wild-type cells. And this is HIV-dependent because the increase in gene expression is not that pronounced as in the wild-type cells. I didn't show you the glutathione peroxidase data, but this is also the case. Now, 
there's HIF will not only increase gene expression, but it will also form or induce or promote more production of glutathione. And glutathione is, of course, then used to uh, reduce uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and form water. And how does it uh, does this work? HIF will increase the conversion of glutamine to glutathione. And it does this by inducing more glutamine uptake. What you see here, these are the HIF stabilized cells. So in the, when there is HIF stabilization, you have more glutamine uptake and also more conversion of glutamine to glutathione. And for the ones who like to become old and healthy, you can buy all this glutathione, the reduced glutathione. It is this. Take it and hopefully it will help to reduce your ROS levels. So there is a, not only gene expression, there is also more production of glutathione. And of course, to have this uh, cycle going on, the oxidized glutathione has to be reduced again to uh, uh, reduced glutathione GSS. And by doing this, it depends on the levels of NADPH. Now, NADPH can be made either in the pentose phosphate pathway or in the serine uh, synthesis pathway. The, there is this uh, molecule made. And what we have seen is that if there is more HIF levels, there can be more NADPH production by the pentose phosphate pathway. That's what we see in skeletal cells. Often in other cell types, like tumor cells, there is an increase in NADPH production by the serine synthesis pathway. So it can depend on the cell type where more NADPH is produced. So you don't have only gene expression, you have more GSH, glutathione that's produced, and also more NADPH that's produced. So in total, HIF will try to reduce ROS production and also in, in, uh, increase uh, antioxidant. Now, to uh, confirm that this is important, we try to reduce the ROS levels and see what is the consequence. And these are the graphs here. So this is ROS levels, here is cell viability. And in normal conditions, the wild type cells and the HIF uh, knockout cells uh, behave the same. They have the the same amount of total ROS and the same amount of uh, cell viability. Now we also introduced then NAC. This is an, an exogenous um, antioxidant. If you use or if you culture your cells in hypoxia, you see that there are increased ROS levels also in the wild tap, but especially in the HIF knockout. And if you add this NAC, you can reduce the ROS levels again. Uh, all to wild type levels. Now, if you look at cell viability, if you have, uh, if you culture your cells on hypoxia, you see a reduced cell viability in the HIV knockout, and you can restore it with adding NAC, uh, certainly after 24 hours. But to be correct, this restoration is not completely. So there is still reduced cell viability in the HIF knockout cells under hypoxia. Now we looked at some other possible mechanism and what we found is that in the uh, HIF knockout cells under hypoxia, you get energy stress. That's here shown by the increase is phospho AMPK levels, which is an energy sensor. So likely there are metabolic adaptations and that are beneficial to reduce the ROS levels by, but by the same time, this metabolic adaptation can induce energy stress and this can also decrease cell survival. Why would there be energy stress in hypoxia? Often there is not only a decrease in oxygen supply, but also nutrient su supply in an avascular environment, like you can see here in the broad plate, where you have only blood vessels at the surroundings. And of course, in hypoxia, metabolism is rewired. Like I already mentioned, you have an increase in glycolysis, and this is to compensate for the decrease in glucose oxidation because less glucose is going into the TCA cycle. Of course, glucose will then consume much more, and if there is a decrease in glucose supply, 
then cells can be, uh, come uh, or there can be an energy stress in these cells. In addition, you have a decrease in the oxidation of the fatty acids. So this is a shutdown. And did we, uh, this we could also show in, in our skeletal cells. So if you have an increase in HIF levels, you decrease uh, fatty acid oxidation, which is shown here with the skeletal progenitors and also in the chondrocytes. And of course, bad oxidation or fatty acid oxidation is a, a large source of ATP production. So it can be that by reducing this beta oxidation, fatty acid oxidation, you will come in energy stress. And then finally, it can be that's not only energy that becomes limited, the energy supply, but also other pathways that are reorganized, rewired. And for instance, uh, I've already mentioned glutamine metabolism, and glutamine metabolism is necessary for making glutathione. The, uh, for uh, the antioxidants, but it's also used for other metabolic pathways. And what we have seen is that HIF increases glutamine metabolism, and one part is that it makes more alpha-ketoglutarate. And alpha-ketoglutarate is necessary also for collagen hydroxylations. Glutamine is also an important amino acids for the synthesis of proteins and also for nucleotides via aspartate. And what we have also shown is that glutamine can be converted to acetyl-CoA and by doing this, acetyl-CoA will have an effect on histone acetylation in chondrocytes and thereby influence the expressions of genes like COL2, COL10, uh, agrican, uh, VGF and so on. So what I want to pro uh, propose is that HIF will redu reduce ROS levels by reducing ROS production, it will increase antioxidants, and this is possible by metabolic adaptations. But this can be at expenses of energy and biosynthesis, and thereby also impair somewhat um, the survival. Now the final thing what I want to discuss is that if you have ROS levels, you will have damage at several levels, at the DNA levels, but also at uh, phospholipids and also at proteins. And perhaps we have not looked carefully enough at these pathways that can also contribute to cell damage that you can't detect sufficiently, and, but at the end progressively contribute to cell death. And ferroptosis is, of course, the lipid peroxidation that occurs under the influence of ROS. And th then you have your plasma membranes that will be ruptured. And this is a special form of cell death that will not be detected by caspase. It's not a classical cell death. And here also you have glutathione that is important to prevent these uh, ferroptosis assays or, or pathway. So that's one part, the lipid peroxidation, and then of course you have the oxidative protein damage, where you can oxidation of cysteines, uh, thiol groups, or uh, C uh, pathways. And then you have the denaturation of your protein, with, that is targeted then to proteasome, proteolysis, or to the lysosome. So it can be that we don't, this is not easy to detect, this oxidative protein damage. It's not easy to detect in vitro and certainly not in vivo. And perhaps we are missing this pathway or these changes in oxidative stress. So what I want to conclude is that HIF is important to prevent excessive ROS levels and to prevent damage. It does this by metabolic rewiring of the cells, but can have then secondary effect of energy and biosynthesis. And this damage that can occur at the same moment, perhaps we don't detect it sufficiently, and perhaps this is not inhibited, inhibited by NAC. And we have to use other inhibitors to really see how much is this oxidative damage that contributes. So I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank the lab and also the funding agencies. And of course, I'm happy to see the arguments of Stina. So thank you, Gareth. That was really very interesting, and this is part of the story. And now, Stina, tell us the other part so we can decide which one we like more. 
So thank you so much, uh, Anna, for organizing this webinar and thank you uh, and for your kind words. And thank you so much, Gert, for a beautiful presentation. Uh, I will uh, I will defend the thesis that a key role of a HIF as a survival one as a survival factor is to decrease uh, in to prevent that uh, that hypoxic cells become anoxic because anoxia is incompatible with life. As uh, Anna uh, said, my uh, laboratory studies uh, hypoxia-driven pathway, and more recently mitochondria and my, uh, bioenergetic metabolism in skeletal development and disease. Uh, years ago, uh, we showed that uh, the fetal developing growth plate has uh, an ina hypoxic uh, region. Now, uh, as uh, Gert beautifully showed uh, and explained, if one is a key factor in cellular adaptation to hypoxia, uh, when oxygen tension is uh, above 5%, generally if one is barely detectable in the cells, when oxygen tension drops below 5%, then if one progressively accumulates. And Gert has beautifully shown uh, the uh, pathway that regulates uh, if stability in the cells. Now, years ago, using uh, a genetic tool that is called CRELOX-P, that allows to knock out uh, the gene of interest in specific cell types. Uh, we knock out if one in mesenchymal progenitors so that give origin to chondrocytes um, and in the, in the developing growth plate, and the result was devastating. So this is a, a hind limb of a mouse that lacks if one in uh, chondrocytes and this is a normal one you see the difference uh, the if knockout has a very very short and extremely deformed limbs so if one is necessary for endochondral bone development and when we look at histologically, you know, it was decades ago, it's almost embarrassing to look at that, but, you know, the times fly quite quickly. So, histologically, we show that the growth plate uh, is when the mutant was clearly wider, misshapen, and severely hypocellular. And this uh, hypocellularity was due to a massive, massive cell death. Okay, uh, you see this by tunnel. Uh, chondrocytes in absence of if were dying off. Now, interesting enough, the, uh, cell, the viable cells at the periphery of the developing growth plate and lacking if were much more hypoxic uh, than controlled. And we were intrigued by this observation and because we thought that since it was such a dramatic increase in hypoxia, need to, had to have a pathogenetic role in uh, the HIF phenotype. Oh, oh, okay, so what, okay. As, uh, uh, now, uh, the, the degree of, of oxygenation of any cell is the integration of oxygen availability and oxygen consumption. So is this dramatic increase in hypoxia that we observe in if one null chondrocytes due to decrease the oxygen availability or increased oxygen consumption? And with GERT, uh, we, years ago, uh, we provided uh, nice, beautiful evidence that indeed uh, oxygen availability to the mutant growth plate probably is not the real, the key reason why these cells uh, are so hypoxic. So if it's not uh, availability, it has to be consumption. And as Gert mentioned, if one, at least in vitro, not only upregulates glycolysis and lactate fermentation, but also inhibits mitochondrial respiration and therefore mitochondrial oxygen consumption with a variety of molecular mechanisms. 
Consistent with this finding, when we isolate uh, mutant chondrocytes, the chondrocytes is lacking HIF, and uh, we measure uh, mitochondrial uh, beta, uh, oxygen consumption using the seahorse technology, it was, clearly, it was clear that uh, lack of HIF leads to a severe increase in oxygen consumption, both at basal states and uh, uh, in the uncoupled state, okay? So this is consistent with what we know, the TIF1 suppress mitochondrial respiration. Okay, so at this point we know that the IF1 is a critical survival factor for hypoxic chondrocytes and that the key function of IF1 is to suppress mitochondrial respiration. Therefore, the obvious question, is a stimulation of mitochondrial respiration detrimental for the survival of hypoxic chondrocytes? To address this question, we use another genetic tool. We knocked out in chondrocytes the factor TFAM. TFAM is encoded by a nuclear gene and is a factor that regulates the transcription of the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA encodes 13 subunits of the electron transport chain. The other subunits are encoded by the nuclear genome. A key function of TFAM, therefore, is to regulate mitochondrial respiration and the electron transport chain. Though uh, TFAM also regulates mitochondrial biogen biogenesis. Now, when a TFAM is knocked out in a highly vascularized tissue, so such as the brain, a heart, well, the results are devastating. Um, the, the cells in these tissues die. Now, uh, so what we did, we knocked out TFAM uh, again in mesenchymal progenitors and in their descendants, therefore in chondrocytes, and the result was quite interesting. Uh, the limbs, first of all, deform. And this is an, histo an histology, a T13.5 of the humerus and the, T15, and the E15.5. And without going into the details, it's pretty clear that the loss of TFAM does not have dramatic consequences on the overall structure of the growth plate that uh, looks uh, remarkably normal when compared to controls, okay? Uh, but it's, it's a little bit delayed in hypertrophy, that is the last step of endochondral bone development, and we don't know why this is the case yet, but overall it's pretty normal. Proliferation of chondrocytes is normal, there is no ectopic death, differently from what happens in other tissues, and the thin hypoxic region that we saw in, a highly, in the normal growth plate is absent now in the TFAM normal growth plate indicating that clearly mitochondrial respiration occurs in the growth plate and is a determinant of the thin hypoxic region. But overall, again, the overall structure is a little bit delayed, a little bit shorter, but overall quite normal, okay? So at this point, in order to address our original question, is uh, in, the increase in mitochondrial respiration the reason why if null cells die, we generate the double mutant that lacks both TFAM and IF1 in chondrocytes. And the result is striking. So the double mutant lib is now normal in shape when compared to control. You see the difference with the IF null alone, okay? It's a little bit short again, the double mutant, consistent with the TFAM knockout. And histologically, is pretty clear that the loss of TFAM Restore, restores the overall structure of the earth only, okay? Not only, it fully prevents, almost fully prevents, the severe hypocellularity of the earth growth plate, and almost fully prevents the massive cell death that we observe in the earth knockout. So here we have a situation in which we knock out HIF in chondrocytes, the cells die. We knock out HIF and TFAM in chondrocytes and the cells are back to life. Not in all the growth plates, there are some growth plates in which there is still a little bit of cell death and we will go back to this. Now, the issue is what enables 
the survival of if null chondrocytes when TFAM is knocked out. And again, this is not only true for the limbs, it's also true for other bones such as the sternum. You know, it's the same thing, right? No, we knock out if one, and now the hypocellularity and the cell death of the if knockout is prevented. So, as uh, Gert said, uh, the paradigm in the field, and Gert gave a beautiful contribution, fundamental contribution to support this paradigm, is that uh, indeed um, the key survival function of if is due to uh, regulation of loss. So, we thought, okay, so that's what happens. We knock out the if. Uh, we increase mitochondrial respiration, we increase loss, cells die. Now we knock out TFAM, we impair mitochondrial respiration, uh, we impair production of ROS, and that's why cells are back to life. So we measure the ROS uh, in our mutant chondrocytes. We, we isolate the mutant chondrocytes from the different genotypes and from controls, and we culture it in hypoxia uh, and in normoxia. We measure total ROS and mitochondrial ROS by fax. Now, total ROS do not change much across the different genotypes and uh, the, different, the different cultural conditions. When we measure mitochondrial ROS, we see a decrease in mitochondrial ROS in the double, tifamifenal chondrocytes, that is expected because we have impaired uh, the electron transport chain. But let's look at the if cells, what happens there. So uh, let's look at the signal intensity that is more uh, significant uh, than, more informative than the number of positive cells. So first of all, we see that hypoxia in, in wild type cells doesn't seem to increase loss. In fact, if anything, significantly decrease loss, mitochondrial loss in this system in comparison to control, okay? Now, we knock out HIF, and it's true. Uh, the, in ROS in, in the mitochondrial ROS increase a little bit, okay? So that's consistent with the increase in mitochondrial respiration. But this level of ROS is very similar to what we see in wild type in ormoxia. So we thought, well, then why the if cell, null cells die if this level is similar to this? And by the way, also if null cells in normoxia do not show a significant increase in loss, only in hypoxia. Okay, consistent with the fact that if one is particularly stabilized in hypoxia. Okay, then we thought there has to be something else in addition to, to increasing loss because it's unlikely that this modest increase can explain that massive cell death. Especially because, again, this level of intracellular ROS is very similar to wild type in normox. So what is, what is this, uh, something else? We, we went back to our in vivo data, and what we in vivo we show, you remember that dramatic hypoxia uh, that uh, is uh, present in the if knockout. Well, the dramatic hypoxia is basically fully recovered, fully prevented by knocking out TIFA. Okay? That makes sense because by knocking out TIFA, now we impair the mitochondrial oxygen consumption. And in those growth plates in which there is still a little bit of cell death, there is still more hypoxia than in controls indicating almost an association between cell death and degree of, hypo degree of hypoxia. And this, is, uh, and this is the quantification. Now, when we do seahorse analysis in vitro, we have a similar event uh, that mimics what happens in vivo. So basically, loss of TFAM prevents the, 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 the increase in oxygen consumption that we observe in the if null cells. And when we look at cell death, again, in vitro now, across the different genotypes and the different cultural conditions, the only cells that have increased the death are the if null cells in hypoxia. Now, remember that, and this is prevented by loss of TIFA. 
and uh, happen in a cast space free independent manner. Now, remember that, uh, that uh, those uh, hypoxic cells, if non hypoxic cells, have levels of ROS that are similar to wild type in, in normoxia, okay? But wild type normoxia do not have that increase in cell death that we observe in the if not. So, what we like to propose is that the key function over here is to suppress mitochondrial respiration and mitochondrial oxygen consumption in order to prevent hypoxic cells from becoming anoxic, because this would be incompatible with cell survival. That's our hypothesis. Now, the issue is why anoxia is not compatible with survival. Interestingly, when we do metabolomic analysis of the different genotypes and in the different cultural conditions, and we measure AT intracellular ATP and the ATP-ADP ratio, we don't see any significant change across the different uh, situations. This tells us to, and uh, when we measure the phospho MPK and PK ratio, again, it's the same. Nothing much changes. So, in our system. So, these tell us two things. That the if null cells are not ATP deficient, and that loss of TFAM and if one somehow leads to a compensatory increase. And in fact, when we measure a lactate, we see in the double mutant a compensatory increase in lactate. And this actually has been reported also for other cell types. Eh? The loss of TFAM uh, leads to an impairment of mitochondrial respiration, leads to a compensatory increase in glycolysis and lactate fermentation, with mechanisms that are not very clear yet, though in some cell types it's been reported that could depend on the NADH-NAD uh, NAD ratio. Okay? Anyway, the, the issue is that in this system, if null cells do not seem to be ATP deficient, at least a steady state. That means the cells are somehow adjusted. And uh, uh, clearly, chondrocytes have an amazing uh, plasticity. It makes also sense because if, if null cells have a lot of mitochondrial respiration going on. So at this point, the next question is, if these cells are not ATP deficient, how anoxia kill chondrocytes? despite normal levels of steady-state intracellular ATP. And the problem is that we do not have an answer to this question yet. We are working on it, but we do not have a, an answer. We think that is a significant question to address for a variety of reasons, especially because if our model has a, a more um, widespread uh, significance, then this means that hypoxic cells could be selectively killed uh, by knocking, by improve by augmenting mitochondrial respiration. Conversely, uh, hypo is key, hypo hypoxia of cells could be improved, like uh, hypoxia that occurs in ischemia, could be improved by impairing mitochondrial respiration. Anyway, we are not there yet. We are trying to figure it out right now how anoxia kill cells in presence of normal levels of ATP and uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a challenging task, but uh, we like it. And here I would like uh, to thank the members of my lab who have contributed uh, to this uh, uh, project that we call the TIFAM project, and also a collaborator at Stanford Judge with Edward Labor. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I think that you gave us a lot of information. And I would like to open the discussion. And I have already a question in the chat. Please, uh, uh, either you can uh, unmute your microphone or write your question in the chat. So the first question is from uh, Michela Ciocca. Uh, she asks, uh, can hypoxia be useful to induce cell death in cancer, or do they have different mechanisms to manage hypoxia in order not to do not to undergo cell death? Well, I can start. This is an amazing question. Of course, cancer is a very complex situation. Yes, 
but in principle would be wonderful to have the opportunity to kill cancer cells by making them anoxic. And uh, we could make them anoxic by blocking angiogenesis, by increasing mitochondrial respiration, by doing both. Okay, Gerrit, you want to add something? Yes, I think that's one of the problems, of course, from cancer. There are, in the cancer offered in a tumor, there are hypoxic regions and there are normoxic regions. And often these are the uh, hypoxic regions where uh, cells are that can metastasize. So often these are hypoxic cells are adapted already to go into the circulation and metastasize. And also the hypoxia is claimed to be also or to make the, uh, the tumor cells chemo resistance. So sometimes it would, in theory, it will kill your uh, tumor cells, but likely tumor cells have so many mechanisms to adapt to it and even use the hypoxia to uh, circumvent uh, the situation and even metastasize or become resistant. Yeah, uh, still very difficult issue <laughs> yes. to obtain. Okay, um, other questions? I don't know, Marco, if you have access to other chats for the questions? Uh, nothing on the YouTube chat. Okay, not. so you have your own question, otherwise I have some. Marco? Oh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I have a question for uh, both of you uh, regarding uh, the mechanisms that you have uh, uh, illustrated to us that is focused mostly on the bone and cartilage. Uh, do other tissues share similar mechanisms? So if one has similar rules, uh, same rules in uh, uh, non-mineralized tissues, I don't know if you have any answer. For both the oxidative stress and uh, the, the uh, prevention, Okay. Right. So, uh, Gert would agree with that, that if one is uh, now considered a survival factor, right, uh, for hypoxic cells. And uh, again, the current paradigm, as uh, uh, Gert beautifully illustrated, is that it's a survival factor with mechanisms that uh, uh, involve uh, uh, ROS production. Um, and mitochondrial, you know, mitochondrial respiration. Again, uh, our data would suggest that, that at least in chondrocytes, it's not only about ROS, or probably ROS are not so key, uh, and there is something else to it. Um, again, the two uh, theses are not actually mutually exclusive, uh, because they can be both... Uh, well, I understand this, but chondrocytes are very peculiar cells because exactly. they still are right. in uh, So we, in have not tested, we have not tested our model in other cell types. And, and you, Gert? Survival is, in, you know, is a key function of it. Uh, and uh, we, you, go ahead. We have used the skeletal progenitors, for instance, from the periosteum. And what we can do, for instance, if you culture these cells, uh, with hip stabilization, but you give normal nutrients, they can make more glutathione and they can even make glycogen. And so if you then implant these cells, they are adapted already and they can use this glycogen for uh, reducing growth and uh, uh, the glutathione and the glycogen for making glucose. So you, you can play with it that you can uh, adapt yourself to hypoxia and then they will um, uh, use the nutrients that are available. But this is only hypoxia without nutrient deprivation. And I think this is really important if you have only hypoxia or only also nutrient deprivation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a difficult for the in vitro situations, because what we do, we culture ourselves in hypoxia, but we don't reduce the nutrients in our medium. And that can be give a, a different aspect than what we see in vivo. So I think we have to, for the future, to try to see how, what are the nutrients that, for instance, chondrocytes see, what our osteoclasts are seeing, what our, uh, I don't know, osteoblasts are seeing, and this is not known. Yeah, sure. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Another point that I have is regarding the vasculature. You are expert 
in in this field. So, uh, in your conditions with your uh, genetic uh, models, uh, is there also any uh, change in the vasculature that, in some way, can uh, cooperate with uh, the in the within the tissue to you know uh, change the uh, ROS production, the oxidative stress, and the and everything, or it's completely independent. I can perhaps start. So what yeah. we have done in the tissue engineering approach, um, there we see that uh, if you stabilize HIF, you have more VGF production. But still, the attraction of blood vessels is not really enhanced. And I, w what we reason, but we don't have all the data for it, is that uh, Endothelial cells have to migrate, and even if you have high VGF, they will not migrate faster. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's uh, the difficulties, I think, in attracting blood vessel. You can increase VGF, but of course, VGF can also become toxic and uh, uh, lead to leaky vessels. So you can enhance it a little bit, the angiogenesis, but not that it will solve everything. That's my opinion. Okay. Yeah. And and, uh, yes, uh, actually, we did a few years ago a beautiful study with GERT uh, uh, to address exactly this issue. Uh, because uh, at that time, uh, we had a different model in mind. Uh, we know that when we knock out the Jeff in the developing growth plate, we have a cell death phenotype that is very similar to the IF knockout. So, in VGF, as Gert said, is a, a classical downstream target of IF. So, at that point, the equation was, sim was simple, right? We knock out the IF, we decrease VGF, we decrease the vasculature and the surrounding soft tissues, and that's why we decrease oxygen availability and cells die, right? So, this was the hypothesis that we were testing and we worked together on that. And... Um, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that when we measure blood vessels in the surrounding soft tissue in the if knockout, we saw some changes, but they, there was variability from gross plate to gross plate, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gert. But then we did a really a, a genetic experiment again. We overexpressed the VEGF, uh, and, uh, and when we overexpressed the VEGF in chondrocytes, interesting enough, we rescue the cell death due to the VEGF loss but not the cell death due to the HIF loss. We rescued a little bit, actually, to be totally honest. And we rescued also a little bit uh, the increased hypoxia, but not much. So we overexpress the Jeff. Now we make tons of blood vessels in the surrounding soft tissue. So we increase oxygen availability to the growth plates. But this does not correct either the cell death or the increased hypoxia. And that's why we thought if it's not availability, it has to be consumption, oxygen consumption. Okay, so we are close to the poll, that seems possible. So I would like just to give you one minute for each of you to stress better or more why we have to vote for uh, one uh, hypothesis than the other. So, Stina? Yes, well, you know, biology is never black and white, right? <laughs> so, biology is always more complex. Uh, our data suggests, uh, indicate that, uh, at least in the context of the growth plate developmental model, uh, ROS may not play a critical role in mediating the survival function of IF. And uh, anoxia per se seems to be the problem. Um, our in vitro, in vivo data would support the model. Of course, in order to fully prove it, uh, we need to identify why anoxia killed the cells. Uh, again, nothing is black and white, but our data do not support a critical role for mitochondrial cells. Thank you, Sina. Gert, your turn. Yes, uh, I fully agree with Stina that, of course, if you change something in a cell, you will change uh, have, uh, all the pathways. So it's not fully black and white. Totally agree. I think there is some importance of ROS, and like I uh, showed the data also, it will not explain everything. But there is certainly, HIF will certainly try to reduce ROS levels as much as possible. Is this not the end? Likely. 
But what I want, also want to stress is that at this moment, I have some doubts that we can measure all the ROS levels correctly, certainly in vivo, and that we can measure all the oxidative damage. And that we therefore perhaps underestimate or cannot uh, yeah, pinpoint everything, how much importance is for the oxidative stress. Okay, this is good. So, uh, Marco, I need your help because we didn't test the, the both systems. So maybe if you can uh, open your microphone and let us know what we have, we have to do. Okay, perfect. So I'm sorry for the technical problems, but so um, you have two options. In the chat, you have, uh, you have a link that, is, that takes you to a polling system and you can just choose your, uh, uh, your favorite option. And the other option is, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, yes, we okay. see it. Mm -hmm. The other option is to uh, take your phone, uh, shoot a picture or scan this QR code, and go to the, to the app and choose your, uh, your favorite motion. So I see a lot of people are already voting. I think we can, uh, we can give them one minute to vote. Thank you. Maybe two minutes. What do you think? Yes, in fact, I see they are voting. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so the poll is closed. I will stop sharing the screen and we'll go check the results. Hold the line. So, Marco, you disappeared. <laughs> Moment of truth. <laughs> yeah, I'm just building We never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is good because both uh, lectures were absolutely excellent and uh, we have probably more doubts than <laughs> oh, <laughs> also I questions as, as ever in science. The beauty of it, the beauty of it right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So who cares about who won? Exactly, <laughs> the beauty of it is to say, okay, now we have that discussion. Oh, I can okay. tell you it has been a very, very tight, tight victory. Yes. So this is good. So congratulations to both of you because it means you both raised very good points. So thank you. Here, thank here you. <laughs> and we had 60 people voting, so 60% uh, more or less of the participants voted. And I'm going to share the screen again to show you the results. So see, we are transparent. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, anoxia is 52% and uh, preventing oxidative stress is 48%, very, very close. Looks like the, the Brexit, you know, when uh, only 2% of people <laughs> <laughs> decided to go out of Europe, so very similar. So, uh, congratulations, Tina. <laughs> congratulations. We, we, this means we, that the field is very interesting and we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So, uh, we are not giving money, otherwise, you could split. We still have a virtual price, so I'm going to share the screen again. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Oh. So, <laughs> the first day, <laughs> we both won. It was so close. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Honestly, we're so close. But this is yeah. good because this means that we raise doubts, that we raise questions. So you know, yeah. mm -hmm. you, know you know, the beauty, in addition to uh, what you have described scientifically, is the enthusiasm that you have. And I think that for the young people that are attending this TMS, and most of them are young, this is really absolutely great. Because if you want to Thank be you. a scientist or stay in <laughs> science in some way. You have to be enthusiastic. It's the That's only true. way to get to, 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 to get fun. We are I always say that we are paid to have fun because yeah. this is what we like to do. Yeah. That's to, so be, to be passionate by science. Exactly. 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 Yeah.
Exactly. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to thank um, the two speakers for these excellent uh, presentations and all the audience. Uh, we reached one, uh, 109 uh, people. Now they are less because, you know, <laughs> everybody has other things to do, but it was a good audience for this uh, quite difficult uh, uh, topic. And thank you very much uh, uh, also uh, to the audience for uh, attending and i hope that we will have another opportunity to sure. to have you both in the tms thank you thank you very much thank you bye 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 thank you bye thank you bye thank you so much it's a